There was one problem with Newtonian gravitation that was first identified more than 200 years after Newton's Principia Mathematica that arises when trying to use Newton's laws for an infinite, homogeneous, and isotropic universe with constant matter density. Hugo Seiliger, in 1894, and Carl Neumann, 20 years before, found it and wrote, Newton's laws applied to the immensurably extended universe leads to difficulties and irresolvable contradictions if one regards the matter distributed through the universe as infinitely great. But what was exactly the problem? An oversimplified way of understanding the Seiliger-Neumann paradox consists on realizing that for any given force of arbitrary magnitude and direction on a test particle, one can always draw a sphere of source masses that exert that force on the test particle, and draw the remaining source masses of the universe in concentric spherical shells that do not exert any gravitational force on the test particle by Newton's shell theorem. A spherical shell of source masses exerts no net force on a test mass located at any position within the shell. The final picture is an infinite, homogeneous and isotropic universe with constant mass density, in which the force on the test particle is undetermined. You may think that the force must be balanced out and zero for symmetry reasons, and probably Newton thought the same way. But if you follow Newtonian gravity, it's not zero or infinite, it's mathematically undefined. More precisely, the gravitational force on a test body is the sum of forces exerted by all the other masses, and the integration over all the other masses to compute the force fails to converge, and Newton cannot tell you the magnitude or direction of the force. And from that force, you should be able to compute an observable, the acceleration of the test particle. If you want a more formal description of the paradox, I will leave John Norton's intuitive explanation and review of Seiliger's formulation in the description. Notice that this problem is not meant to prove that Newtonian laws are incompatible with our universe, which is not static with constant density and not perfectly homogeneous, and its observable and causally connected part is not infinite, but to prove an incompatibility with these reasonable assumptions of a static, homogeneous and isotropic universe with Newton's laws, which also coincided with the idea of how the universe was at the time of Seiliger. Among many attempted solutions from different authors, such as Seiliger's solution of adding an exponential attenuation factor to the inverse square law of gravity, Einstein, agreeing with Seiliger in the problem, also offered a well-known modification to Newton's laws in 1917. He first pointed out that Newton's laws required a constant limit for the potential at the spatial infinity, and this is interpreted as the matter density becoming zero at infinity. The same happens in general relativity, where local solutions, such as the Schwarzschild metric, are asymptotically Minkowskian and flat. But for an infinite universe, matter density is constant at infinity, and the potential is infinite. Then, he introduced the cosmological constant in the Poisson equation representing this average matter density, and equivalently the same mechanism in general relativity. But why did he introduce it in general relativity? As we explained in one of our previous videos, that was not because he wanted a static universe, but because he wanted a closed one to satisfy Max principle. We explained Max principle in our previous video. Einstein's definition of Max principle was that the metric tensor is completely determined by the stress energy tensor, and that in a consistent theory of relativity, there can be no inertia relative to space, but only inertia relative to other bodies, and in an empty universe there should be no inertia. To satisfy the latter, Einstein realized that he needed some boundary conditions in the metric different than the flat Minkowskian spacetime. In particular, at that infinity, the time component of the metric should increase to infinity, while the space component should vanish. This implies that the potential energy becomes infinite at infinity. He tried to introduce these asymptotic conditions in general relativity, but found that there was no stress energy tensor satisfying them consistent with the fixed stars having small velocities with respect to the speed of light. An infinite potential at infinity made no sense to Einstein, because for a bound system according to the Virial theorem, high potentials imply high kinetic energies, and this imply large velocities, in this case of the stars, which Einstein thought they were more or less fixed and static in the celestial background. Thus, he rejected these boundary conditions and divergence of the metric because the gravitational potential should be small according to the small velocity of the stars. 
and by introducing the cosmological constant, he achieved a closed universe without the need for specifying boundary conditions. But today we know that the stars very far away do have a very high velocity with respect to us, if we interpret the redshift as coming from the velocity far away from us. So perhaps Einstein was wrong in rejecting the divergence of the time component and vanishing of the spatial component at infinity for a local solution like the sparsit metric. We explore the idea of whether the expansion or curvature of the universe at large can explain galaxy rotation curves in general relativity without the need for dark matter, but we didn't discuss a modification of the divergence of the metric at infinity. Curiously, the theory that explains galaxy rotation curves without the need for dark matter also exhibits an infinite potential at infinity for its local solution. We explained MOND in our previous videos and how impressive it is that a simple modification to Newton's laws with a single new constant can generally remove the need for dark matter in galaxies. MOND's potential diverges logarithmically at infinity and exhibits some sort of scale invariance, as the velocities do not depend on the distance from the source. We have also insisted on the reasons why MOND might have an origin in Max principle and the relativity of inertia. Does MOND come from the relativity of inertia and its divergence of the metric at infinity as Einstein initially considered? Moreover, Norton seems satisfied with a solution to Seeliger's paradox within Newtonian gravity based on the relativity of acceleration in cosmology, found by Malament in 1995. Thanks to the infinite homogeneous and isotropic background, the Newtonian accelerations, which are the true observable thing because we don't observe the forces, avoid the issue of the paradox if the following modification to Newtonian kinematics is introduced. The decomposition of gravitational free fall into an inertial trajectory and a gravitational deflection is conventional. We are free to divide the free fall motion into any combination of inertial motion and gravitational deflection we please, as long as the latter corresponds to gravitational potential satisfying Poisson's equation. This is of course related to Max principle and the relativity of inertia, but Norton doesn't mention it. I will leave in the description the paper from Norton explaining this solution. Thank you very much and see you next time here in Independent Physics.